Okay, so I've given several talks on CVVH before, and CVVH, CRRT, ultrafiltration, hemofiltration, MUF, SCUF, CVVHD, CVVHDF, these are all just umbrella terms. It's like, it's like, it's like acronym soup, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, but they all basically have the same root, mm -hmm. but they all actually do something different. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see what's happening here. It says there's an error. There's no error on the, the YouTube, is there? It's all good? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah, looking good as ever. Yeah, it's there. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, good. Um, so what it really comes down to is homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. Having the body's systems physiologically in the optimal place for the body as a whole to function, mm -hmm. all of the organs to function. And when that's out of whack, it's a real problem. Mm -hmm. So what is CRRT? It stands for Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy. Mm -hmm. Now I've given a talk before where mm -hmm. I have criticized the name because I think what's wrong with CRRT is the name. Mm -hmm. Because it's so much more, everybody sees continuous renal replacement therapy and they think, well, it's just a form of dialysis, but it's not. It can be used in that form, fashion, mm -hmm. no question about it, but it is not simply a form of dialysis, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but it's an umbrella term used to describe a variety of therapy modalities used to treat renal insufficiency, fluid overload, electrolyte and acid-base disturbances, removal of metabolites, and to some degree, remove inflammatory mediators, basically creating homeostasis. Which is good. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now you have to have sufficient DO2. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other factors involved. This is not a panacea. It doesn't cure all problems, mm -hmm. but it's very important. Why does it exist? Well, it exists to fill a void. <clears throat> when you look at dialysis, and on the left side, you see clearance in percentage. And on the bottom, you see a variety of things, urea, creatinine, myoglobin, you know, sodium, potassium, chloride is in there somewhere, you know, on the, uh, uh, on the smaller size. Basically, that's what dialysis is able to clear. And you can see that as you, and this is because it's diffusive clearance. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But if you basically look, when you get out to about seven, 8,000 uh, 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 Daltons in size, mm -hmm. then you're only clearing about 20%. When you get out to about 15, you're basically clearing nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. The kidney, on the other hand, that's what the clearance profile, if you don't mind me saying it that way, of the kidney is. Mm -hmm. So what CVVH or CRRT attempts to fill is that void. Now you have normal filters, which have a cutoff of about 60,000 KD and you have high cutoff, which go out to about 65,000 KD, mm -hmm. That's, uh, or 65 KD, 65,000 Daltons. Albumin is 66 KD. Mm -hmm. So even with the high cutoff filters, you're not going to remove plasma. Mm -hmm. All you are going to do is remove plasma water. And that's a very important distinction, okay? So what got me started on this road that I am on and have been on for some time, you ever since you've known me, you know I've been very fond of CRRT, CVVH, ultrafiltration on, on bypass, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you've always known me to be like that, right? Mm -hmm. So what got me started on all of this is actually the paper that you see up there. This paper was written by Claudio Ronco, and Ronaldo Bolomo. Dr. Bolomo is from 
uh, from uh, uh, Australia, and uh, Dr. Uh, Ronco is from Italy. And I, I was really fascinated with this, with this uh, paper. So as I go down and look here, there is Dr. Claudio Ronco. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna ask you to notice, and it's very important that you notice this, these are all people in his lab in Italy. Mm -hmm. What is something you notice about the people in this picture? This is in Italy. Mm -hmm at the International Renal Research Institute in Vincenza. Mm -hmm. What's something you notice? Um, they're all young and- well, except for Dr. Ronco. Young. Yeah, except for Dr. Ronco, but his staff. Um, they're pretty small. Small, yeah, small. They're All pretty small. small. This is one of the big criticisms, and I'll get into that a little mm -hmm. bit as we go further. Mm -hmm. But basically what he did in this paper, this was one of the first papers I ever read about this technique. It was actually designed to determine uh, dosing or amount of replacement or ultrafiltration, however you want to say it, mm -hmm. per patient. And he took three groups of patients, all matched fairly reasonably, mm -hmm. okay, for a total of 492 patients, 425 ended up being randomized. Okay. And into three groups, group one, was going to get 25 milliliters per kilogram per hour of replacement fluid, the other 35 milligrams per kilogram per hour, and the third group was going to get 45 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Now, what does that mean? What am I saying? The blood is gonna go through a hemoconcentrator. Mm -hmm. They're going to remove 25, 35, or 45 mls per per minute, per minute of the ultrafiltrate mm -hmm. and they're going to give or no i'm sorry 45 milliliters per kilogram so 25 35 or 45 milliliters per kilogram per hour, per hour. of ultrafiltrate okay. and replace that with a solution that has the formula of what you want the plasma water to look like mm -hmm. So it's a bicarb-based, normal physiologic fluid, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's basically what those measurements mean, or the 25, 35, and 45. When you look at survival, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a group. I, I did it on my computer, but not here. So let me make sure I get that. So that's that, there we go. So when you look at survival, group one, you see the survival was down just under 40%. Mm -hmm. You see in group two, it jumped up to 50%. Mm -hmm. And you see in group three, it was about 55, 56%. Mm -hmm. So you see there was a statistically different, there was statistical difference between groups one and group two, not statistical difference between group two and group three, but you still can look at this and say between group one and group three, mm -hmm you go from 40% survival to 60% survival just using this therapeutic modality in high, high dose. High, high, dose. High, dose. high dose. High dose. That's what's important. Mm -hmm. Because I think CRRT is frequently used ineffectively by not dosing it high enough. Mm -hmm. And we can get into that sort of as we go along here to some degree. So what is it, what is it and what is it used for? Well, we talked a little bit about this already. Acute renal failure, mm -hmm. acute kidney injury, acute fluid overload, mm -hmm. metabolic derangements, acid-base derangements, mm -hmm. inflammatory mediator atten attenuation to a degree, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, creating a physiological environment to relieve the stress from the body systems. Essentially, like I said before, homeostasis. So the mechanisms of action, you have ultrafiltration, you have diffusive clearance, mm -hmm. and you have convective clearance. What are those? Well, here is, we all know this already, okay? I'm sorry to go back to high school mm -hmm. chemistry, but we're gonna go to it anyway, all right? Mm -hmm. You see the flask up there with the semi-permeable membrane, 
you pour a solute into the, to the one side, it diffuses across the membrane from higher concentration to lower concentration until it becomes balanced, and there you go. Mm -hmm. We've seen that happen a billion times, we all understand that. Mm -hmm. This is ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration is when you, if you look at the flask on the left, positive pressure is applied to one side or negative a pressure applied to on the flask on the right, but the net effect is you're moving volume, you're moving fluid across the membrane and it's basically hydrostatic force. Now it can also be osmotic pressure that does this, but this is hydrostatic force. Mm -hmm. We're all familiar with it. We know what we're, you know, volume in a cylinder decreases with the pressure that you put in all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We all understand that. We've been through this before. So I just want to reserve a refresher, okay? Mm -hmm. Convection is when you drag solutes across a membrane during osmosis or ultrafiltration. It is used for the removal of mid middle and large molecules. That's where you saw that graph I showed where we're trying to mimic more the kidney. Now you're never gonna get all the way out to it, but you get a lot further than you do with just dialysis, intermittent dialysis, which is just diffusive clearance. Mm -hmm. The greater amount of the fluid that moves, the greater the solute loss. So that's very important, an extremely important point in that if you have something, an evil humor in your plasma water that you want removed, if you're doing low dose versus high dose mm -hmm. ultra CVVH with convective clearance, mm -hmm. which one do you think is more likely to remove more of what you don't want? Right, the high one. The high dose. Right. Of course, mm -hmm. it just makes, makes sense. intuitive sense. And we're talking about going all the way back to high school mm -hmm. to look at what we already, already already all know and applying it to what it is we're doing today. Interesting. But we forget mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. So Crazy. let's take a little deeper look at what is diffusive transport and what is convective transport, okay? So basically this is a hemoconcentrator. You see the blood on one side. Mm -hmm. You see the pores, uh, which is in gray, and you see the green, which is the effluent side or the dialysate side, mm -hmm. okay? On the left, it's green because there is dialysis fluid running through there, mm -hmm. like you would do with tr traditional dialysis. Mm -hmm. That's diffusive transport. Mm -hmm. There's a concentration gradient and the ions on the blood side are going to diffuse across. Mm -hmm. But if you look at convective transport, which in this case is being caused by there being a higher pressure in the blood side than in the gray side, which is the effluent side, now green, gray and yellow, you see that large blocks of water, plasma water, are being forced through carrying the material that you want or the solutes that you want removed. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Okay, good. Thank you for telling me that made sense. <laughs> I'm just about confused myself. <laughs> now, this is, this is a very, very, very important slide. If I didn't say it enough, I'm gonna say it one more time. This is a very, very, very important slide. Let's go over it. Here is, our patient, okay, right here. The patient's sodium is 140. Mm -hmm. The potassium is 5.2. The chloride is 104. The albumin is 2.9. The total protein is six. And the hematocrit is uh, 21%. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, you know, all in all, I mean, that's a little low. Those are a little low, but not horrible. Okay, I've seen worse, right? You know, but 2.9 is you know, getting low because you're gonna start third spacing. Mm -hmm. Now, we take the blood, we run it through a pump into the hemoconcentrator, back up and back into the patient. Mm -hmm. Now you notice it's going from red to blue. Mm -hmm. In the dialysis world, they don't work like they do in the cardiac world. Mm -hmm. In our world, 
We take venous blood, which is blue, and we make it arterial blood, which is red. red. That's what we do, yeah, make right. blue blood red. Right. The reason why they use red and blue here has nothing to do with oxygen. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the concentration of the blood. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you draw blood gas from a patient mm -hmm. and the hematocrit is 18 and the PO2 is 200, mm -hmm. okay? It looks bright, bright red. Right, right. If you took that same blood, but the hematocrit, instead of being 18%, was 45 or 50%, would it be as bright red? It probably would still be bright, but not as bright. Not as bright. Not as light. Not as light, right. It's not as, it's not right. It'll look darker. Yeah, it'll look darker. Right. It will look darker. It will look darker. That's why this is like this. You're taking diluted blood mm -hmm. or blood that is credit 21%, putting it through this filter, and depending on how much effluent you remove, you're making it appear darker mm -hmm. because it has a much higher right. hematocrit. Hematic. It has significantly less plasma right. water. Mm -hmm. That's why you see red to, red to blue in the dialysis world. Okay. Nothing whatsoever to do with oxygen at all. However, this is another piece of this is very important. If you look over here, the amount of albumin removed, because remember this filter is about 60 to 60, 60,000 Daltons or 60 KD. Mm -hmm. Albumin is 66 KD. 66. Okay. Higher. Higher, higher protein, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So warp, plasma water will come out easily, mm -hmm. but plasma, Al protein will not, because albumin is the smallest, it's at 66. Mm -hmm. it, there's nothing else smaller right. for protein. Right. So there's albumin, none. Total protein, none. Mm -hmm. Red blood cells, hematocrit, none. Mm -hmm. But if you look over here, the sodium, the potassium, and the chloride are exactly mm -hmm. the same. No change. Good. So this fluid mm -hmm. that you see here, what we refer to as the effluent, effluent. Uh -huh. is isoosmotic. Extremely important concept to understand. Mm -hmm. You do not selectively remove ions when you do ultrafiltration. Mm -hmm. Which is great because we, we don't want that. Sometimes you do, but what do you do instead? Here's the downside. Mm -hmm. It's isoosmotic, but if your potassium is seven, <laughs> then you want to pull it off. You want to remove, you want to remove the it. potassium, mm -hmm. but it, you're, not, you're not going to change the patient's potassium no matter how much fluid you take off. Now, the hematocrit will come up, That's the true. protein level will come up, the albumin level come up, mm -hmm. but guess what else goes down that's not in this represented in here? What is it? You should know it right off the top of your head. Uh, what else goes down on the... The patient's total circulating blood volume, volume yeah. because you're removing the fluid. plasma water. Of course. Exactly. Of course. So you're on pump. You hook the hemoconcentrator up. The hemoconcentrator's filling up with crystal clear, it looks like it's drinkable water. <laughs> that looks like, it does, it looks like spring water, filtered yeah, water, it right? It it's is filtered. It's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty clear. Uh -huh. What's happening to the level in the reservoir? It starts to go down. It starts to go down. Because you're pulling off the, 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 the fluid. Correct. Off. In the patient without a reservoir, you're just simply removing it from the patient. Mm -hmm. So if the patient was fluid overloaded, mm -hmm. a great choice. Of you can remove an enormous amount of fluid in a hurry if you mm -hmm. wanted to. Mm -hmm. And as the albumin level goes up, what happens to the fluid that has been third spaced because of excess hemodilution? We're pulling it out. Starts to come back into the vascular mm -hmm. space because you increase your oncotic, oncotic pressure. pressure. Mm -hmm. Now it starts coming back mm -hmm. and you can remove some more. Mm -hmm. And over time you get their patient's total blood, total body blood volume or fluid load reduced. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you a picture later, a picture that I've, very, I've used many, many, many times. I need a new one, but it's <laughs> so representative of what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So this is, these, this is an extremely important concept. The effluent is isoosmotic. Mm -hmm. You do not selectively remove ions. Mm -hmm. Now there's a way to alter them, but you do remove total body fluid volume. Body fluid. And intravascular fluid volume first, which means your hematocrit, your total protein, your albumin level will go up. Mm -hmm. You're gonna concentrate the blood. Hemo concentration, mm -hmm. right? So if you look here, adsorption is another concept that is extremely important for everyone to understand. It's probably one of the most important concepts in this whole talk mm -hmm. because there's a lot of debate about how much, and I'm gonna show you some studies that are very, very interesting. There's a lot of debate as to whether CVVH mm -hmm. in the traditional form mm -hmm. truly does remove inflammatory mediators. And um, there's some interesting studies that have been done where effluent has been tested, interleukin loads in the body have been tested, um, and it's mixed, it's very mixed. I used to believe it absolutely did, but it's questionable. What does happen though is adsorption. And adsorption is a very important concept. Mm -hmm. It's where inflammatory mediators will adhere mm -hmm. to the filter fiber media itself. Wow. And eventually the pores will become clogged. Mm -hmm. So if you look here, you see this is the amount. Right. Here's the membrane. You see they're being stuck on the membrane material itself. Mm -hmm. And what's coming across is much fewer of them that was there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. they because they're all right here. They they're stuck. Up. Correct. Mm -hmm. They're adhering, adhering to the filter media. Mm -hmm. So it's adsorption mm -hmm. versus absorption, adsorption. right? Mm -hmm. We're all familiar with the term adsorption. Mm -hmm. So we know, we know. But this is what happens. And this is very good for uh, uh, B2 microglobins or microglobulin rather, mm -hmm. cytokines, coagulation factors, and uh, anaphylactoxins. Oh, yeah, inflammatory so, mediators, right? Inflammatory mediators, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this slide here, what I want you to look at is the molecular cutoff in Daltons. So 65,000 Daltons is 65 KD. You'll hear it said a bunch of different ways with the various different hemoconcentrators that exist. This comes directly out of their product manual. So this comes in their, in their uh, what, is they, what do they call it? insert, package insert, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see that there's polysulfone. There's also uh, AN69, which is kind of a polypropylene fiber, and various different fibers have different degrees of adsorptive properties. Yeah. Um, also, there's coatings that can be put on them to increase their adsorptive properties. And then when you look at the cytosorb, which I'll show just a little bit of, mm -hmm. that's a molecular adsorbing, almost like a charcoal filter wow. that removes huge amounts of inflammatory mediators. This technique is good for some, but that's really meant for it, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So if you look here, we've talked about a lot of different things. This is yet another concept that you have to be able to understand in order to truly understand CVVH. And it's called the sieving coefficient. If you look at the normal kidney, which is basically the same graph that I showed before, mm -hmm. if you have a sieving coefficient of one, it removes all of it. If it's zero, you remove none of it. If it's 0.5, you remove 50% of it over a whatever period of time you're measuring, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you look, you can see that the conventional hemoconcentrator, as far as sieving coefficient is concerned, mm -hmm. depending on the molecular weight, is going to remove very easily up to about a thousand uh, or one kilodalton or a thousand, a thousand daltons. Mm -hmm. The high flux, is going to go out a little bit further, yeah. but it's only still gonna be about 20, 22,000 Daltons. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when you're trying to remove something that's 50,000 KD if you don't have, or 50 KD or 50,000 Daltons, if you don't have 
adsorptive technology. Mm -hmm. But sieving coefficient is very important. And basically, this is sieving coefficient. You see the two molecules. The B2M uh, is going through very easily. The albumin is too big. It can't fit through the hole, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so sieving coefficient. This picture is probably the best representation of what that is. Mm -hmm. But everything has a sieving coefficient depending on the pore size of the fiber, fiber that you are passing it through or the pore size of the membranes, whichever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So sieving coefficient is something you want to know what it is, how it works, and what it is for the particular device you're using, mm -hmm. okay, and how that's going to work. So this is convective transport. It's the same as we talked about already, convection. You can see a representation of it where water flux across the membrane, the pore size and pore size distribution of the membrane mm -hmm. contributes to uh, how well it works, molecular size of the molecular mass of what you're trying to move across, molecular shape is important in configuration, and the charge of the solutes and the charge of the membrane. Again, mm -hmm. talking about adsorption. But you can see here the very large green albumins not going across. Mm -hmm. The smaller are going across the, uh, the, the, the purple and the uh, yellow. Mm -hmm. If this was diffusive clearance only, you would only see the yellow, none of the purple. Mm -hmm. So it does help fill a gap, but I don't think it's as perfect as I thought it was, but we'll talk a little bit about anecdotal experience. So here's a sieving coefficient example. You have solute one, it has a sieving coefficient of one, mm -hmm. and you see very easily all of it goes across. Solute two has a sieving coefficient of 0.5, mm -hmm. half of it goes across. Solute three has a sieving coefficient of zero, nothing goes across, nothing goes across. okay? Now here's the cytosorb. If you look at the various different inflammatory mediators that exist, mm -hmm. they're all on these graphs that you see here, okay? Mm -hmm. And then here are some basically normal things that we look at, okay? If you look over here at albumin, which is 66 KD, mm -hmm. in a normal filter, anything before this with enough convective force should theoretically go through, all right? But we're gonna talk about that because if you look up here, you see IL-6 right here. Mm -hmm. And you see that it's down around 20, what, 25, 25 KD, somewhere KD. around there, okay? So the cytosorb controls all of this. Hemodialysis is only down here. Ultrafiltration is somewhere I believe we're gonna find around here because when I'll show you the studies with the IL-6, you're gonna see why I'm saying that, okay? Mm -hmm. It's very important. Here is basically a just yin-yang representation of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. What's pro-inflammatory, what's anti-inflammatory. Both can be deleterious if uncontrolled mm -hmm. when you have a, cytos a, cytokine, a cytokine storm, and I'll show you that here in a second. Mm -hmm. um, you can go massive pro-inflammatory load, uh, an enormous anti-inflammatory reaction, mm -hmm. and then you can have a complete drop off and become essentially immunocompressed. You become immuno, you have recruitment and then you have fatigue. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the end game on a lot of these patients exists out in that area. It's kind of like a, no, sorry. It's kind of like a, uh, a, a seesaw. You have the pro-inflammatory side and the anti-inflammatory side, and you want those to be in balance. When they're not in balance, let's see, maybe I can go back to it. No, I'm going the wrong way. There you go. There you go, there's the seesaw. Mm -hmm. You have the pro-inflammatory side, and you have the anti-inflammatory side. So when you look at SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, you have the pro-inflammatory mediators and the anti-inflammatory mediators. Mm -hmm. You have cell uh, and tissue damage. You have compensatory anti-inflammatory response, the CARS. Mm -hmm. So you have SIRS and you have CARS. 
If that stabilizes, you have recovery and survival. If it becomes out of control, mm -hmm. it leads to multi-organ failure and ultimately death. Very simple representation of what happens. Mm -hmm. Here is the majority of severe cases of death from COVID-19 result from runaway inflammatory responses within the patient's own immune system, causing a cytokine storm that is difficult to interrupt. Here at the top left, you see the normal immune response triggered. You have all of the regular things that happen in your innate immune system. You're gonna start developing your, uh, your, uh, your uh, adaptive immune system. You have an immune response that cycles out of control. Mm -hmm. You have a further inflammatory reaction that continues to increase. And eventually the inflammatory response uh, begins to destroy healthy cells leading to acute lung damage. That's your ARDS profile basically. So start from the top left and just go around it and make a big circle and come back. So the actual antigen that may have created the original problem may not be what is actually now destroying the lungs. Mm -hmm. It's your own runaway immune system, which is either principally responsible for it, mm -hmm. or it is, uh, it is exacerbating what the virus itself is doing as it continues to invade cells and replicate. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps both or it's the virus has been somewhat blunted, attenuated, managed, but your own runaway inflammatory system is now uncontrollably damaging your cells. Making it worse. Making it worse. Co-inflammatory. When it needs to just right. back off. Mm -hmm. How do you control that? Very difficult to control, but that's what we need to control. Now, as I said, I have always believed that high dose ultrafiltration could help that. Mm -hmm. And I still do, but I have no proof of it. That's true. Zero. Mm -hmm. Now there is something that seemingly can, and we'll talk about that because it's available in Europe, but it's not, a, it's, it's available here now, I think in, uh, in uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, compassionate use. But uh, again, we're trialing convalescent plasma for 130 years, this is, a little newer than that. It's been around for a while, mm -hmm. but just not well recognized or accepted, but it's also being used. But it seems to make more sense to me. Of course, yeah. Both make sense, mm -hmm. but they're totally different therapies. Mm -hmm. I don't think this one should be over the other. I think both should be very ag aggressively looked at. So there's your cytokine storm. We kind of talked about that. With any cytokine storm, and this is something that kind of sort of uh, that made me a little uneasy when people are talking about this hypercoagulability associated with COVID. I don't think there's a hypercoagulability associated with COVID. I think there's a hypercoagulability associated with cytokine storms. We've known that for years. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the reason we're seeing that. But anyway, you see what I've talked about already, the immune paralysis, when that occurs, you're really in a lot of trouble. Renal failure is a big problem. Uh, clotting is an issue with cytokine storm going into DIC, shock, uh, inflammation, organ failure, and of course, increased risk of infection when you do get to the immune paralysis state. Mm -hmm. Now you're immunocompromised. So you're just, you're just open to anything at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I think that when you look at the process, you know, you're going to have decreased DO2. ECMO makes sense. Mm -hmm. You're going to have uh, certainly acute kidney injury. You're going to have m major fluid imbalances. You're going to have, yeah, with cytokine storm, hypercoagulability, which you can be treated with anticoagulation, appropriate anticoagulation. So I think that we are just too slow to aggressively treat some of these patients. Now, I understand you can't pick the ones that are going to do it. I mean, you can't always, and sometimes you just think they're not going to when they do and you got behind the eight ball. Um, and that happens and I recognize that and respect that. But I don't think we're, I just don't think we're aggressive enough sometimes. Yeah. I don't know, what do you think? Um, I mean, I agree. I think, I, I think that, you know, we've waited too long to um, take a look at these 
different type of um, strategies on attacking this, you know, this virus. And, you know, maybe they should have been a little bit more aggressive and maybe look more into the, 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 um, the, conv- the, the plasma and, you know, versus what we have available now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could be like what I mentioned earlier, maybe it's just the unknown and people are, don't have enough research, don't have enough data, but, you know, maybe it's something that we should take a look at and hopefully if we can get a hold of it and maybe produce something that would be successful, mm-hmm. we could use it for the next next time. I we- think so. But let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Hey, can you go ahead and open the phone lines? Just let people call in if they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a question. Well, well, let's hold off on the question. I just want to open the phone line in case someone wants to call if you can. I only have a few minutes left and we'll get to that question. But um, how many times have you seen where you get called in to put a patient on ECMO mm-hmm. for whatever reason and you go there and you assess the patient, you look at the chart, you look at all the what's been going on and you ask yourself, why are we... Why are we doing this now? We should have done this seven days ago. Absolutely. How many times has that happened? The first thing I ask, how long has the patient been critical? You know, on the, the vent. Yeah, on the vent. What do we do? What What do we try? How long is their How long is their saturation been ninety two? Uh, yes. Yep. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's so you know, of course, and I understand. And you know, we we we, we cannot do harm. Do no harm. Do no harm. Do no harm. I I understand that. But I, I, I don't know that we really, we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And I understand that. But um, I guess I'm just maybe a little more willing to be more aggressive. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not in the position to make the decision. Of course. You know, mm-hmm. maybe, that's even, maybe that's better <laughs> for the patients. <laughs> but sometimes I wish those that could make the decision were more aggressive. I do think it would help. Mm-hmm. That's my opinion. Okay. So here is a basic extracorporeal circuit for CRRT. Um, I don't want to go over the whole thing uh, too, too, too in depth, but I'll just go through it quickly. You have access, which is here. You have return, which is here. The, and don't worry about the pressure pods. You have a pump pumping it into the hemoconcentrator. It is removing ultrafiltrate. You can run dialysis through it, so you can dialyze if you want to, and this is continuous as opposed to intermittent, Mm -hmm. or you can use replacement fluid and give it here Mm post-filter, or you can give it here pre-filter. So you can dilute it before it gets to the filter. If you can't use a lot, if you have a high, uh, 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 you can't anticoagulate the patient well for some reason, you can pre-dilute it and that will help to keep it from clotting in the system. Mm -hmm. But you can, the best for clearance, when you wanna talk about clearance, I would forget about this for right now for the sake of this argument. Mm -hmm. You're you're ultrafiltrating the blood and you're returning plasma water the way you want it to look into the patient. So if the patient's hematocrit is, or I'm sorry, potassium is eight, the potassium here will be eight. Mm -hmm. If the potassium here is four and you're doing enough volume, it's just like dialysis. You're removing potassium Mm -hmm. and you're replacing it with something that doesn't. So your your fluid balance is zero. You're not removing anything because everything you're removing, you're giving back, okay? But if you're trying to remove something bigger, TNF alpha, and it really does remove it, or IL-6, and it really does remove it, and it's in here, but none of it's in here, then you should have a reduction in IL-6 in the patient, right? Right. Makes sense? It does make sense. Makes sense. Good. Okay, so let let me see how many more slides I have. I have a lot more slides. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna do a part two. How 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 do you feel about this? Good, I like it. Was this I, I, of any value? Did, did it help you understand CRRT any better from a from a from a mechanical perspective? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as perfusionists, we don't um, deal as much with CRTs in uh, our clinical settings. You know, unless we have a patient on ECMO. And unless, you know, most of the time we have the, the, the um, nurses, the bedside run them, 
But I think it's important for a perfusionist, you know, like myself or anyone else who's watching the patient on ECMO, to know what the ECMO is doing and know uh, exactly the rates and uh, mm -hmm. things. It's, it's good to know because we need to know how much is going in, what we're giving, uh, what's coming out. We can kind of help project on what you know our outcome could be and what we may, may need to treat, treat the patient for. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and I think better understanding the technology will better help you to be able to yeah. treat the patient when you have, you know, when you're acidotic, when your lactate levels are high, when you're dealing with a patient who is massively fluid overloaded. Or high um, potassium. Uh, or just, yeah, electrolyte disturbances, yeah. acid-base disturbances. Acid -base, yeah. I, instead of giving the patient bicarb, which is just a bolus here, and a bolus there, and a bolus here, and a bolus there, um, so you're going to basically be up and down. Your pH is going to be normal, right. acidotic, normal, right. acidotic, normal, right. acidotic. Right. Um, in that environment, some, it's some very post filter. You could do it right, but you're using a bi. So what happens when you give a lot of bicarb? Your sodium level goes up. That's true. If you're using a balanced solution, solution. that's bicarb based with the, with the sodium corrected, you can control the electrolytes exactly the way you want them. Maintain and right. right, and your pressors, your inotropes, the heart in general is going to want to work better mm -hmm. because you're giving it a normal homeostatic environment you're giving it its best chance. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to see, now, not, not some nephrologists, because there's, there's a good friend of mine who I have tremendous respect for, who I think feels uh, this way. And I've learned a lot from him as well. He's here in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, but several people here in Houston, several nephrologists, not him or with his group, uh, some a different group, they flip out whenever I see a patient on ECMO because they know the next words out of my mouth are going to be, when are we going to start CRRT? Mm -hmm. Because it makes sense. It does make sense. You know, they don't have. They don't need to be on CRT just because um, they're having renal problems. Correct. They don't have to have renal problems. Correct. But you know, it, with these patients that are on ECMO, initially they're critical, and they've already gone through this roller coaster of, of acid base disturbances. Um, you know, um, inflammatory mediators that need to be removed. So if you wait too long, then you're playing catch up. Yep. And, and sometimes you can never catch up. You can't catch up. You simply can't. You can't. I agree 100%. Listen, you can't. that I feel that way. And I've I feel heard the same them way. say, well, Absolutely. you know, it's mm -hmm. you're increasing risk because you're adding another machine. I said, it doesn't get any more invasive than ECMO. Yeah, you dude. can't get any more invasive. You don't I guess you can take them and do, a, do open that. heart. We're running it through the ECMO. You don't need, need to put it right. in. Right. Yeah. There's no additional line you have no to lines, put in. Yeah. And uh, you know what? You can always turn it off. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter how well the kidneys are working. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You're asking the kidneys in, a, in an already compromised Compromise. milieu, you know, if you will, the whole patient, and the kidneys run on a very tight, very tight oxygen content that it is, as it is. Mm -hmm. And we're asking them to work even harder mm -hmm. after being insulted. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's good for, give them a rest. We're resting the lungs, Absolutely. we're resting the heart, why shouldn't, why does the kidney get the bad? Why, why, do, why do they get uh, 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 oh, the, 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 the leftovers? The leftovers, right? Let's take, to take care of them too. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. You can better control fluid balance. Mm -hmm. You can get their oncotic pressure up with giving albumin. Mm -hmm. You can get them dry, tissue dry, reduce the, the amount of fluid, fluid in the, mm -hmm. right, in the organ parenchyma itself. Mm -hmm. Get it, get the organ shrunk down, feeling better, getting perfused better. You know, edematous organs don't perfuse well. Oh, absolutely. So here we are, we're trying to, you know, and I just think you have so much better control mm -hmm. of the uh, of the patients. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Anyway. I agree, I, I agree. I'm gonna have to do a part two on this because I still have a long way to go <laughs> and we're already running out of time. Who's on the line? Somebody on the line? No. Oh, somebody called in? No. Nobody, is that question? Yes, what's the question? What about using the drugs for pulmonary anemia? Say what? I'm sorry, say that again? What about using the drugs for pulmonary anemia? Drugs using for pulmonary, drugs, for pulmonary, drugs pulmonary edema. for pulmonary edema? Well, what would he like to, to do? Usually we put them on the ventilator and you put them on PEEP. Um, you you know you increase your PEEP, mm -hmm. positive pressure ventilation. You, some, some you treat pepper. the cause of the pulmonary edema, is it? Heart failure? Is it mm -hmm. fluid overload? 
So you treat the cause of the pulmonary edema. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's pulmonary hypertension, you're talking about a different problem, a different animal. You would want to use, of nitric course, oxide. nitric oxide, Flo right? Land. Which most people, most places don't have. Flowland. Flowland, you can do that. Mm -hmm. So you can use inhalers and things like that. But for pulmonary edema, generally the cause of pulmonary edema is going to either be cardiac, primary cardiac failure mm -hmm. or massive fluid overload or something like that, unless you were a drowning victim or something, you know, where you were, where you got it from a negative pressure, mm -hmm. but those aren't gonna be the patients we see. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be caused by one of those problems. So you have to treat the underlying cause, but the best way is to put them on positive pressure ventilation with PEEP. Mm -hmm. So I think we, you know, pretty much do that in, all, all the right. time anyway. We do. Right. Yeah, so that would be the answer to that question. Any others? That's it? That's a comment, but um, I mean, right. Abs somebody absolutely right. Sir, plasma therapy can be established, which can save COVID patients, as this therapy is established in ARDS and COPD and so on randomly. I think it can help to survive. I think so too. Mm -hmm. Good, good so comment. Too. Good comment. I agree. Okay, well, we're out of time. So I think we're going to bid the audience. Min, thank you again for thank being you, here. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. You are my favorite. <laughs> Min is my favorite. Always has been my favorite. I wish, I wish magic could be more like Min. <laughs> okay? I really do. But, uh, and all you perfusionists out there, if you could just be more like Min. You're too he kind. is my, huh? You're too kind. Thank it's you. true. Thank it's you. true. Everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Min does nothing. He still gets the employee of the quarter. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference because I get the, I get to vote, mm -hmm. right? Yes, That's sir. the way to, hey, look, we got to take care of each other. That's it. Father and son. That's it. All right.